my only part of the theme of Palm Sunday is this. Is that Jesus, when he rides in on the donkey, on today, we celebrate Palm Sunday today, when he rides in on a donkey, um, the people are throwing palm leaves on the ground and they're throwing their coats on the ground, making like a pathway for him to ride on. They've taken their cloaks off or their coats off. They've put it on the back of the donkey so he can ride it uh, with, on, on, the, on his coats and on their coats and stuff like that. And so as he rides in, the people begin to sing out, Hosanna, Hosanna. The word Hosanna simply means in both uh, Arabic and also in, in the normal uh, Greek languages, just save me. Or Hebrew, it's, it just says save me. Please save me. So they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. Please save us. Please save us. We need your saving grace upon our life. We need your help in our lives. And so they're declaring that and they're worshiping him and they're declaring him to be the Messiah, the king, after the lineage of King David. And in their mind is this. In their thoughts, in their perspective, Jesus is the Messiah. And some people are calling out and saying, who is this? Who's this guy? Because some people still don't know, but a lot of people know the, the fame of Jesus. He became very famous. Some of you know that. So... Fame is not a bad thing. Becoming famous about who you are. Uh, I think we all need to become famous as Christians. Mm -hmm. We need to be known as Christians. Is that true? In the workplace, wherever we go. And so be, be able to be known that that's who we are. Because we we're called to be the face of Christ, aren't we? It's not easy to be done. Would you agree? But... What's interesting is they begin to cry out Hosanna and worship him. And the Pharisees begin to say, stop these people from worshiping you. Stop them from worshiping you. Stop them from declaring you to be the Messiah. Yet, everything that he had done in that moment was in direct prophecy to the Old Testament, scriptures in the Old Testament. That he was to ride in on a donkey that had never been ridden before. So everything he was doing was to fulfill prophecy and the things of God that God had called them to fulfill. And so what's interesting is that when he, his whole life, as Wendy said today, his whole life was a life of giving. But I would say this also, that his whole life was also disrupting the cultures of the day. Amen. Yeah. Constantly disrupting. Because he, how, when he came to the earth, he came with a different culture. Yes. He's the first one. Who he was, he was the representation, he was the ambassador of heaven. We're all called to be ambassadors. Basically, representatives of heaven. We're citizens of heaven? Yes, amen. If we're citizens of heaven, we are to act as citizens of heaven. Amen. Correct? Yeah. Jesus came. He's the first one to ever show us this example. He came as a representative of heaven. He came as an ambassador to earth to represent what heaven would look like on earth. How many of you know that culture is completely counter, uh, countering intuitive? Is that right? Counterintuitive to the, to the culture of the day and age. Yes. Yeah. You're not. So here's these Pharisees. They get upset with him all the time. Because he's always countering their culture or their religious beliefs and their understanding of what they believe in. So he's constantly, you know, <laughs> sticking the knife in. <laughs> it's terrible, isn't it? He was very disruptive. How many of you know Jesus was a disruptive? He was quite aggressive in some cases, too. Did you know that? Yes, he was. He wasn't always meek and mild and placid. 
you know? I do like the word Greek, uh, meek, I should say Greek. Meek, meek, yeah. I, I like the word meek. The, the word meekness literally means a wild horse under control. That's its definition. He was meek. He was totally in control, under control of the Father. So he was, you know, Moses said he was the meekest man on the earth, but I think Jesus was. So he was, he was just a man under complete control. That didn't mean that he didn't get angry, didn't mean that he didn't get upset, doesn't mean that he didn't kind of disrupt people and disrupt their comfortable cultural lifestyles and their belief systems. He messed it all up. He was constantly messing it up. Yes. And let me tell you something, as believers, I don't mean to deliberately go out and mess things up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mean we're called to do that. And just, but we are called to say, no, 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 this is the truth. Yes. This is what God is like. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. This is what it really is. And so you will have some people that will go, wow, this is fantastic. You will have other people that will go, I don't like you and I don't like this. Yes. It's just what's going to happen. Yes. We can't help that. So a lot of people don't, don't make that stand sometimes as a Christian because they don't want people to be upset with them. But if we're going to establish a culture of the kingdom of heaven and the, God's rulership in our house and in our church, in our home, every single one of you, you've grown up in a certain type of culture. Yeah. Your home, ladies, mainly ladies do this, ladies do this more than men sometimes, is that you create a culture in your home. Of peace, joy. I know all of you ladies have created this culture of, in your homes, peace, joy, happiness, love, and kindness. I know you ladies, all of you have done that. <laughs> so when we walk into your homes, we feel the peace, the love, the joy, and the kindness in your homes. I'm just pausing there for a minute. But we do the same, guys, don't we? So we, we've, we've created a, you know, we all know this. We, we've walked into a house, we've walked into a, a place, and immediately you just know, it's like, whew, this is, this is a nice place. I feel, wow, I feel really good here. Or you can go into a place and you just go, Ooh, there is tension in the air. Ooh, ooh, I, what's going on in this house? You, you know there's strife, you know there's discord. Uh, my family, because Emma and Michael and, and, and um, Michael, my son, and all the, they're all here. We went to a pub the other night. We went to... Um, we used to, me and Wendy used to go to this public school. It used to be called The Junction. Now it's called Central Station in Midland area. It's a really good pub. Really good. They have this separate little restaurant area where we go and eat. Anyhow, my whole family, Wendy's whole family was there. And we were the noisiest people in the place. So we're all chatting away and catching up, you know. You can, it's like a big family reunion, you know, in this place. We got the longest table. We got this huge long table. So you can feel it in the place. You know what I'm saying? You can feel you know, and so we we're creating this kind of, and, and some people were getting a little bit, shush, be, be quiet, we're trying to eat our meals here, you know. So, but it, it's interesting that you can go into a place and you can, there's a cultural thing here. And I just think we, we've, got to, we've got to learn on a personal basis, this is corporate and personal. Yeah. We need to be creating culture. Okay, I don't, I, it doesn't matter what background you've come from, what, what country you've come from, you are now citizens of heaven. Yeah. Amen. Amen. 
There's neither Greek nor Jew, slave or free. We're all the same. Male, female, we're all the same. Before God. Correct? And so it's, it's interesting because I, I really believe that every church has its culture, cultural basis too. Whether it's a friendly, kind, welcoming, lovely church or whether it's kind of like militant. You know, I've been in all kinds of different churches in my lifetime. I've been into all kinds. I've been into churches that have created a culture. Like, like Hillsong, for instance, is a, actually a great movement and a great church movement but you can walk into a hill song and they're all pretty much the same they are given to worship they are given to that uh, and and also a leadership type of style of culture they actually are very good at what they do very very good at what they do and so they they have that element and so uh, they've created that culture and that culture does kind of appeal to a lot of people. You catching me? Yeah. And so um, we had a certain type of culture that we had created in Eden Hill when we were there for so long. That's kind of changed a little bit because we've had to move out of the building that we were in. We don't do the same things that we used to do. We don't kind of, uh, um, you know, do the same types of things, but we have definitely got a culture of our church corporately. Yes. Amen? And it comes, it comes a lot of times from, from me <laughs> through the messages I've preached to you over the years. And so sometimes you grab something and you, you begin to believe things and you begin to hold on to certain things. But I just really want to kind of talk about that whole cultural um, creating or disrupting culture if it's not the right culture. If it's not the right type of um, atmosphere that we, are, we have. We need to create a, a real good atmosphere of worship and praise. Teresa did a great job today, didn't she? It was a great job. Yeah, great job. And I think, think the team is, you know, coming along very well. We're all doing very good. And so... Um, my, my whole idea is just to kind of keep pushing that forward. Keep letting them become the, the, the ones doing it. Not me, you know. And then just getting other people in to the, um, right, to the place. And kind of, you know, having them create that culture of worship. This is very interesting because I, I've taught this before. Can everybody see that? Yes, no, kind of so. Yes, no, kind of so. Let me come over there. Is that better? Ah. Every, every church, every nationality, you can go to Cambodia, you can go to Vietnam, you can go to France, you can go to those people, that country, those countries have a certain culture about them. Yes. Correct? Mm -hmm. they, they have a mindset, a way of thinking, a way of behaving. Uh, their lifestyle is a certain way. And it's all, and it becomes there. So, but what's interesting, um, I will show this, this, this um, thing in the church at some point in time. There's an African man by the name of Mully. M-U-L-L-Y. He was uh, orphaned. He was kind of separated from his mom and dad. And this man was a beggar for many years on the streets. He was a street kid. Then he became a millionaire because he started working. He got, gave, was given an opportunity. He became a Christian, became a millionaire. And then at one point in time in his life, he actually gave his life really over to God. And he sold everything that he had. And he started going in, uh, I think it's in Nairobi, started going into the city in Kenya, and he started going in the city and rescuing orphaned children. Some of these parents were HIV, they were dying, and they'd die, they'd leave their kids behind. He would go in and rescue them, and he started bringing them home to his house. He now has about 1,500 children at a compound. This is an incredible story. But 
to watch this movie and this guy's life story is a testimony to a man who was under a certain type of cultural way of thinking. He said in his movie, in this documentary movie type of thing, he says, I will never ever beg again in my life. I will never go and plead and beg for people to give me money. God will supply all the needs. And it's incredible how God's met this guy's needs, met all of his needs supernaturally. Um, they drilled down for water because God told them to drill in a certain place. And they found water. And they were in a desert area. And they were able to cultivate this. What's interesting is that he had to change the way he believed. He had to change the way his cultural background was. The, 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 ten, the 12 spies went into the promised land. 10 of them came back. They all came back with the same report. It's a great place. It's a wonderful place. This is great that God has given it to us. But we can't go into that place because... They're too big for us. We can't fight against this. We can't do this. Two out of the 12 said it's okay because their mindset, their perspective was that God is bigger than that and that God can take us into there. But unfortunately, the culture, did you catch that? The mindset, the way of thinking in the crowd, in the group of people was in such a way that they could not get past that slave mentality. Which meant that they could not overcome, they could not go into that promised land. We all have things like that in our lives. So, what I want to say is this. Every, every culture, this is where we want to get. One, two, three, four, right? Every culture, every lifestyle of any person in this pla on the planet, you go through this process. This is a process that you might go through to get to a lifestyle or a culture or a way of behaving, a way of acting, a way of thinking. Did you catch that? First of all, you have an experience. Then you get that experience validated. Then you get that validated, and then it becomes a belief. Then it becomes a lifestyle. Okay? Any of us. It's how it happens to every single one of us. You grow up with all kinds of experiences. They say that by the time you are eight years of age, you already have a belief system about a multitude of things. How society is, how you are, you're going to be poor all your life, you're going to be useless, you're going to have nothing happening in your life. If you've had a really bad experiences when you were a kid, up until you're eight years of age, you're, you're abused, you were mistreated, all kinds of things, it, re it rewires your brain in such a way that it becomes a belief system in your life. Let's say, um, I can talk about religion, but I can also talk about a homosexuality. Homosexuality, there was an experience that happened in your life. There could have been an abuse, could have been something that had happened in your life. Any sexual perversion, anything like that? You catching me? There's something that happened here, you know, nine out of ten times. Right? You get the one percent that's kind of like, eh, nothing really happened to them. They just became gay happy. Sorry, did I say gay happy, did I? So, experience. Then somehow they just get that validated. The people they are hanging out with, the people that they go around with, it's through art, it's through television, it's through um, reading books, it's through, through whatever you, 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 you give your mind and your thoughts to. That becomes a validation. 
How many of you know the TV is really promoting something of that experience? I, I don't care what it is. I saw a television ad for Optus where, where two gays were getting together. Two men were getting together. I'm thinking, what does that have to do with the telephone company, Optus? What are you doing? Don't do that. It's like every show has to have that element. Every movie now has to have that element in it. Because we have to kind of cater to that. So what happens is that becomes a validation to lots of people. Oh, see, this is good. This is fine. This is okay. Then our country votes for it. See, Rome destroyed itself from within, not from without. Because of its immoral behavior. I'm not picking on if, if that's, you know, you know, I'm just trying to use that as an exp explanation. Okay? Then it becomes a belief system. This is just how I am. This is my lifestyle. This is why I'm just attracted to that, that other guy. I'm attracted to another woman. I, that's just how I am. And it becomes actually a belief. What's interesting is that this part here, right here, this point, at this point here, that is a tipping point. I call it a tipping point. Because you have an experience, it gets kind of validated, but then you, you, you're not really sure. So you can either stay here and maybe not even go here, but then if you go here, becomes a belief system. And the, the, and the next step is usually it becomes a lifestyle. It becomes how you live your life. It becomes how you are. I, I have a very good friend of mine who was actually a pastor of a church for several years. He, has a, he had a wife and three sons. He has grandchildren to this day. He has become a homosexual. He lives with a man. Um, he's actually become a marriage celebrant. And they pray together. These guys, these two guys pray together. He still says he's a Christian. His partner's a Christian. But his lifestyle has become that. It, it, it's actually, it's, it's called a seared conscience. It's become... Something's happened in his spirit man. Something's happened in his thought pattern. It's rewired that that's okay. God's okay with it. So all I'm trying to say is that this can happen to anybody. Did you know what I mean? It can happen to anybody that we can actually become... I don't know why I'm on about that, but anyhow. I'm just... With, with everything that we are in our lives, these things can actually grow in us and become a part of our lifestyle. Um, I'm here today and I'm preaching to you about this kind of thing. And in every, in every, all of us here, we are at different points in different things that we believe in around here. We can be here, we can be here, we can be here, we can be in a situation where some of you might believe um, uh, in healing, for instance. Healing is a very interesting thing. Um, there are some Christians that don't believe in healing. Because they've actually been taught, right? That it's, that it's not true, that it doesn't happen nowadays. It's called cessationism. They don't believe in healing anymore. They don't believe in that at all. I, I know a lot of Christians also that they believe in healing but it's never got to here. So it's not a part of their lifestyle. It's not a part of their Christianity. They, it's okay. They believe it. Yeah, God heals when he wants to. If he feels like it, it's good. But they never practice it in their life. They never pray for the sick. They never 
do anything with their belief system. They've had it validated because the Bible tells them so, because they see it in the life of Jesus. They understand it. They All of that. You okay? See, because, but, but see, I don't want it to just be an experience in my life. Let's say you never believed in it before, but somehow you had your best friend get healed. You're a Christian, you're in church, and all of a sudden you had your best friend get healed. So all of a sudden you had this experience for yourself, or maybe you got healed just by, by you know, God's grace. You, you got healed. You had this experience, and so then you went, oh man, everything I was told about it, now I see in my own personal experience that it actually is real. Where else can I find that? So then you start reading books about it, your Christian books about miracles and healing. You watch a Reinhard Bonnke movie about, about people, thousands of people getting healed and saved in one time. You start reading books, you know, that, that validate the basically, you know, the, the miracle power of God. Um, you, you then validate it through the Word of God and through Jesus' ministry. It becomes your belief system, but unfortunately, many times that's where it stops in a lot of Christians. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, you know? I mean, there's a multitude of things and beliefs that sometimes what you have to do is you have to have, um, have this experience but you have to get it validated so that you can actually begin to believe it but it's not good enough just to believe it it needs to become a part of our lives because I believe that that healing the supernatural miracles whatever it may be praise and worship and joy peace all the things that we have readily available to us as believers should all be a part of our life on a daily basis. See, see, I go to some cultural, I go to some cultures, I go to some places in the world where they don't have the same mindset and the same way of thinking that we do in the West. You go to some countries, they have nothing at all. They don't have health care. They don't have any, any medicines. They don't have anything. So they come to you believing that you can get them healed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I just believe it. Amen. And you pray for them. But we in the West, we somehow, we can, we can have it kind of in our kind of belief system. But because we don't practice it all the time, because we don't tell people about Jesus, because we don't witness to people, because we don't pray for the sick, because we don't do just normal Christianity. I call it normal Christianity. Because if you see Jesus, he was the most normal Christian ever. He was the first one. Wherever he went, he saw miracles. He saw things change, the supernatural happening. Provision made for him all the time. Feeding 5,000 people. You, you and I are, are supernatural beings. We're called to be not just, you know, Greg Bedell was talking about some of that last week. But I, I think what we've got to do is change the cultural thing in our lives. If it's, be, if it's your belief then step out and begin to practice it. Everybody okay? Um, <clears throat> you know, as I'm talking to you, it's, it's interesting because we've become slaves to our beliefs. Like I said earlier, you, you and I, when we're, before we're eight years of age, we have a belief system about th things in life. Right? You, you, you have a certain um, system that is created within you. We become generous or we become not generous by the time we're eight years of age. That can change. How many of you know that can change? My wife said today that she would, when she first got saved, she wasn't a, 
a generous person. Anybody hear that? I heard that. Whew, I heard that. <laughs> so I've had to work on her all these years to get her to be. Yeah, right. But see, that can change. You know, you, your 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 belief system can actually change because. But you know how that changes? You have to fr have a fresh experience in something. You know, even in your giving, even in when you give to God, when you come to church and you give to God, how many of you have given to God and you got nothing in return? Anybody at all? Be honest with me. You felt like you got nothing in return. You know, doesn't the Bible say, give and you shall receive? Doesn't it say that God will just bless the socks off you? Yes, it does. But sometimes we give, maybe with the wrong motive, but sometimes we do give, and we don't get immediate return. We don't get immediate return. But we don't give for that reason. But, but what can happen is that what you need in that moment... I believe you need a fresh experience of God blessing you from out of that experience. Yes. Yeah. You believe in God for supernatural provision in your life. You okay? Yeah. And then that becomes, a, a, you validate it, then it becomes a belief system, then it becomes a cultural thing that you just out of habit... I don't need your money. I got my own. You just naturally do it. Uh, every Sunday. Every pay. Transfer it over. Doesn't, it doesn't even become, doesn't even become, anything. Jesus' lifestyle was what? He was just naturally lifestyle generous. The people around him weren't so generous. In fact, one of them was a thief. And they all forsook, 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 forsake, forsook him in the end. Right? They abandoned him. But he still gave. Even on the cross. Now here's the part of the Easter part coming in. On the cross, the thief goes, hey, will you remember? No problem. You're coming with me. You're coming with me to paradise. No problem. Still out giving. Still giving. Still. John, can you look after my mother, please? Yeah. On the cross. He's giving his life for. That is just. That's just lifestyle. That's just. Oh. What do you need? You need some money? You need a car? Need help? You need blessing? Well, what, what happens? It's just a natural outflow of our lives that we just let the Holy Spirit speak to us and tell us and we just naturally do what we just do. We, we, we respond to the, to, to the Holy Spirit because it's not just our belief system. It's actually become our lifestyle. Can you say amen? amen. Praying for the sick becomes our lifestyle. Praying for one another, caring for one another, calling one another up. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Been praying for you. Been thinking about you. You know, last night my daughter was getting on the plane and as she's going to be getting on the plane just be at our house, we just had the best time of prayer. My son David was there and it was just wonderful. They were kind of prophesying over each other and, you know, blessing my kids as they leave, leave Australia again, <laughs> you know. But just, just a great time of prayer and just praying for one another. And, just, and so I'm just trying to create not just, and I've always tried to do that, just not just create a belief system in them, but create a culture. A church is a part of their life. Church is a part of their life. God is a part of their life. 
Giving is part of their life. So it's so much a part of their life that even my son who is not living for the Lord is a giver. He arrives last Saturday into Australia from Paris. And he gets out and he, call, he messaged me. He says, oh, I've got a passenger. We've got to help this person out. What? So my father-in-law had driven me to the airport because me and my father-in-law were picking Michael up. And so I got out and was waiting at the terminal. And I'm waiting, having a coffee, waiting for Michael to come out. And he comes out with this girl. She's French. She can hardly speak any English. And he's met her on the plane. She was sitting directly behind him. You know, that's not a coincidence. How many of you know that? God, God, is, God is still working through this kid. You know, and sees him at the back, and so she 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 starts he starts talking to her, and so fine, it's a long flight, and so they get off the plane, and he just says, "Listen," he says, um, "We'll drop you off at the train station, and because you got to go into East Perth, she had a, a, a place of accommodation booked up for herself and everything else, and so he goes, "Yeah, yeah, we'll take you in there," and I said, I "said No, we're not going to take her to the train station. We need to take her take her to the place." Because she's not going to know. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to speak. So, so we end up, it's crazy, end up taking her back to our house. And then we had breakfast on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock with all of our family. So we take her to breakfast. And then he takes her into the city. You take my ute. And he takes her into the city. She, she says, oh, I've never seen kangaroos. So he takes her down Beach Road <laughs> to see all the kangaroos in Whiteman Park there. You know, you know what I'm saying? So, so she gets the tour, drops her off right at the place where she needs to go. So that is just normal for us. That's lifestyle. Is that right? It's Jesus' lifestyle. You don't even think. You don't even, like, oh, you, you know. I have people all the time. I had a girl recently just call me up and say, listen, I need an old person, a lady that we've known for years and years and years. She got saved years ago and um, just her life became a mess. But anyhow, we just, she said, listen, I need some help. I need to get to Sydney and. So I said, yeah, what do you need? You know, yeah, I need an airfare. So we just buy her an airfare. What do you do? Of course you do. That's what you do. Eh. Paul goes, eh, eh. Because that's what it is. Eh. Right? It's just normal Christianity in every area of your life. You know, you might be you might have at the time that you were eight years old, you were an unforgiving person. You didn't know how to forgive. You'd been hurt. You'd been hurt and mistreated. And how many of you know it doesn't just happen by the time you're eight? Because things can happen after you're eight. Oh, yes. Anybody have anything happen to your life after eight? Yeah, yeah. yeah a couple things. Good, Paul. <laughs> Only a couple? <laughs> but life has a way of bringing things, an experience, good or bad. If you follow the bad ones around and you get them validated, they actually do become your belief system. Yes. Yes. And they sometimes become your lifestyle. Yeah. We've all met people like this, haven't we? That they're just moody. Hi, how are you? How's your day? How was your week? Enjoying your life? Not much. Can I be thank anything to be thankful about? Uh, uh. Go to another country. See how they live. Honestly, see how they live. You think you got a bad here? My Lord, you don't have a bad at all. 
Most of you have a house to live in, don't you? Yeah. Do I have a house? Or do you have a tin shack? Do you have running water? Do you have a toilet? Anybody got a toilet? Hot water. Do you have, anybody have a hot water here? Nobody got hot water? Anybody got hot water? Yeah, you all doing good? You got power? No? Your power's gone out, has it? <laughs> Where do you live? <laughs> you got one big bathtub over at your father-in-law's place. So if you ever have to need a bath, you just go over to the bathtub, okay? The big swimming pool. So, you know, you know what I'm trying to say is that I, I, I get frustrated with some people because they, they, they complain about, because they've got a culture. They've got a belief system and a culture that they, it's like, get over it. Get a new experience in your life. And let, let that get validated and become your cultural lifestyle. Because I'm a citizen of heaven, and because I'm a citizen of heaven, I have a different lifestyle now. I have a different behavior. I have a different way of thinking. I have a different way of acting. It's all of the above. Now, I might slip up, and I might make mistakes, and I might sin once in a while, or you will, but... <laughs> All I'm trying to say is that that's not the norm for me. There's been things in my life that I've had to actually, I call it deconstruct to reconstruct. So it will take you about two months. Listen to me now. It'll take you about two months to change areas in your life that need changing. Okay? If it's become a cultural lifestyle thing to you, it takes about a couple of months if you are consistent and intentional about changing that. Amen. If you're not intentional and you're not conscious of it, then you will remain in that lifestyle, that way of attitude, that lifestyle, that way of thinking. You will stay there. Is that okay? Because yes. yeah. you can only have a behavioral change by a belief change. Did you know that? Yes. Yeah. A behavioral change can only change when this changes. Yes. Yes. You know, if you're unhappy, you 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 struggle with certain things in your life, you're moody all the time, you're critical, you're complaining, you're negative. I could say, you know, I can give you a two-word counseling session right now. Stop it. <laughs> but ultimately, that, that doesn't help unless you stop it. You know? I, I hate walking into a house. I, I don't like walking into a place and there's just this turmoil. Well, I don't, I mean, I, I go into places like that sometimes because there is turmoil and they've called me up to ask them to help them with their turmoil. But who wants to live in that? Who wants to live in the turmoil and the, and the complaints and the negative, you know, just, no, I don't. We can create the culture that we want to live in. And we do. You create the culture you live in. You know, the thing is, I've said this before, and we all know this, because I've said it a few times, and that is that what your conversation in your head is so different to the conversation that you're hearing from me now. Okay? We have two things also there. It's called your subconscious, conscience, and your conscious mind, right? 80% is your subconscious. Yes. The old things, the things that have been built up, they're back there in the back, back, okay? They're in the sub part of us, right? Okay, they are actually your belief systems. They have to change. See, Christianity is a wonderful thing. 
Coming to church is a great thing because you get lessons like this <laughs> that help you to begin to kind of shape a new way of thinking, a new way of acting, a new way of being. You okay with that? Yes. Okay, so... Uh, okay. So a change of circumstances doesn't change your belief system. And what causes the problem, a belief system just needs to be, you know, modified, changed, um, and helped. Okay. So I don't know what else to say. I just think that the whatever that added, whatever that thing is there that is in all of us that different things for different people they're, they're there and they're our defaults they're the things that we fall back on because it actually you know this might be a good thing to do is journal I heard this recently by Paul Scanlon Paul Scanlon said this he says journal your thoughts Yeah, no, I know. Ooh, some of us go, oh, I don't want to do. But maybe, maybe, because what you are saying to yourself many times while I'm talking to you is completely different. Right? Journal your thoughts, your conversations. Think about them. Write them down. If your your certain train of thought is always fearful always negative, always complaining, always moody. If there's certain things like that, then those are the things that you need to say, you know what, there's, there has to be an opposite to that. There has to be something different to that. And I want to create that culture in my life. And it's going on, on like a fast. You know what a fast is? It's called a, a you know, stop doing that repeating the same thing over and over again like if you're saying saying the same thing all the time change what you're saying your conversation your thoughts if you're moody all the time <coughs> yeah absolutely bringing your thoughts captive to Christ amen okay that's it We'll stop there. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Wasn't the best Easter sermon, uh, past Palm Sunday is, um, message, but I just really felt like we just need to kind of create a culture in our church, in our, in our own lives. You create the culture in your house. And you, you, we can create something fantastic here that has a feeling about it, an atmosphere about it, of worship and praise and of the presence of God. Did you know what the children of Israel did in the Old Testament? They didn't camp around the Word of God. They camped around the presence of God. That's the difference. I think if we started to camp and make our tents and our abode around the presence of God, that would begin to change a lot of things in our lives. That would create a culture of the presence of God. Amen? That's what I want. Okay. I'm not going to get all that through to everybody in one sermon. I know that. So, some of you have heard this before, haven't you? Maybe a few times. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. We just thank you for your grace, your goodness, your mercy, and your kindness. God, your mercies are renewed to us every day. Lord, let our lifestyle, let our behavior, let our actions, our words be of a culture and a lifestyle that is just so pleasing to you. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, just be acceptable unto you, O God. Let, let the things I say that the things I do, Lord Jesus, be things and words and actions that are glorifying you and that are changing me. Holy Spirit, I release your presence right now just to minister to hearts and lives in this place. That you begin to convict us of things in our lives, areas in our lives that we just, we just need a change of thought in. 
We just need to kind of change the experiences that we've had and let them become the belief system of our life that God, all things are possible with you because we believe in you. Lord, let us change what we say, change what we think. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You know, the Bible's a good thing because you can actually take some scriptures and just keep repeating them. I, I think sometimes there's some things that you just need to, a scripture you need to find and just keep repeating that. Amen. Repeating that over your life, you know? Because it changes, your, your conversation changes the way you think. Changes the way you believe things. Okay? I also just want to pray and ask this week, why not, not so much pray, but just this week, Ask the Lord to help you in whatever area, because I know I've said a lot of different things, but I know that the Holy Spirit's working with me today. Amen. And He's going to ping something on you. He's going to put His finger on something that you, you know in your heart and life that that's the thing that keeps creating the wrong culture. Okay? And so just let the Holy Spirit deal with that area in your life. Let Him heal that. And show you how to change that. If it's a conversation, if it's a way of thinking, let him change that in you, okay? And, and just try to create a culture in your home this week that's just... Ah. No? You're laughing at me now? <laughs> it's all good. Amen?